Russian explorers versus frigid Arctic storms, furs worth more than a pile of solid gold, and an orthodox religious tradition that lives on to this day, the untold truth of Russian Alaska is anything but frozen. As the Russian Empire drove east across Siberia and towards the Pacific Ocean, it encountered a group of tribes collectively known as the Chukchi, who today continue to live in the Russian Far East alongside the Bering Strait. The Chukchi, per their folk tales, were familiar with the other side of the Bering Strait. Chukchi folk tales share numerous motifs, symbols, and myths with Alaska natives. One story, the tale about the flying shaman, includes a character that traveled from Alaska, suggesting trans-Bering contacts between the Chukchi and other Siberian tribes in Asia and the native peoples of Alaska. Russian explorer Simeon Deznev rounded the Chukotka Peninsula in 1648. This desolate region, covered in permafrost, is the closest Russian territory to the United States. At some point, he was told of the existence of two great islands to the west inhabited by big-toothed people. One of these islands referred to the Alaskan Peninsula, which includes the Aleutian Islands. Equipped with this knowledge, Devznev's successors pushed further east toward America to learn more about this mysterious land and the resources that might lay there. By 1711, Russian maps had begun depicting a land east of Siberia. Curiously, the maps claimed the inhabitants had tusks growing out of their cheeks and tails like dogs. Explorer Dmitry Gvozdev confirmed the existence of Alaska in 1731, though there were no signs of any walrus-like people. In 1740, the Great Northern Expedition under Danish commander and explorer Vitos Bering made the first European landfall in Alaska under the worst of conditions. The original scope of the Bering Expedition was to find out if the Russian Far East was connected to America via a land bridge. After setting sail from Kamkochka with two ships, Bering's small party was separated during a storm that blew his ship towards a mysterious island against the magnificent backdrop of snow-capped mountains. He had landed on Alaska's Kayak Island. On Kayak, Bering's party found a series of abandoned huts, suggesting the presence of human habitation in the surrounding region. So his party explored the length of what today are the Aleutian Islands, where they encountered the Aleuts. After a gift exchange, Bering's party turned back to Kamkochka. They spent a miserable winter on Bering Island, tormented by the local Arctic foxes that stole their food and belongings. The crew survived on sea otters and sea cows and managed to return to Kamkochka. Bering, however, did not live to report his discovery. He died on December 8, 1741, along with half of his crew. Following the second Kamkochka expedition's Alaska landing in 1741, Russia began to gradually settle Alaska beginning with the Aleutian Islands. The first to make the jump were Siberian serfs. These men operated as independent traders and trappers, sometimes by coercing Aleuts and other natives to trap for them and then selling their furs for a profit. The fur trade operated much like the later gold rushes of American history. One Russian trapper went to Alaska and returned to Kamkochka with a load of otter pelts, which he sold at an enormous profit. The subsequent fur rush brought a wave of traders to Alaska. Some stayed behind, making local loot trapping and business partners. But the disorganized nature of the trade led the Russian government to bring some order through the creation of a colonial company. In 1799, the Russian-American Company, a joint stock company resulting from the merger of several smaller trading enterprises, received a monopoly on the Alaskan and North Pacific fur trade. It subsumed independent traders, which became its employees, and a booming organized Alaskan fur trade was born. The Chinese elite became the principal and most lucrative market for Alaskan fur, but the profits soon attracted the attention of American, British, and French trappers, who saw thinly settled Russian America as an enticing business and colonial opportunity. Russian America never had more than 800 permanent settlers at one time, and that was at the colony's peak. But Russia still hoped to hold on to Alaska and expand its influence along the Pacific Northwest coast. Meanwhile, American and European settlers and explorers were moving northwest too. To solve territorial disputes and ensure that they did not spill into conflict, Russia offered the United States a deal in 1824. The Russo-American Convention between Alexander I and James Monroe was an agreement that mutually recognized American and Russian navigation rights along the northwest coast and Alaska, while forbidding them to do any business with each other's settlements without the express permission of the local governor. The boundary between the two spheres was set at the 54th parallel, which both states agreed to respect. The most important aspect of the convention for Russian Alaska, however, concerned trade with natives. The treaty's fourth and fifth articles allowed American ships to engage in trade with natives, both along the coast and in the interior. Goods, such as firearms, spirits, and other war munitions were the exception. While these articles were meant to resolve tensions and prevent conflict, they also undercut the Russian-American company's authority in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. Russia had effectively surrendered its Alaskan monopoly by allowing foreign merchants into its lands, eventually leading to the territory's sale to the United States. 
Russian colonists and frontiersmen encountered new groups of people native to Alaska, from Aleuts to Clinkets. But these rough and tumble frontiersmen were not particularly well disposed to the native population. Russian traders frequently enslaved natives and killed those that refused to cooperate with them, leading to a cycle of massacres and counter-massacres. To add to the hardships of first contact, native Alaskans had no immunity to old-world diseases such as smallpox, which devastated the native communities, taking the lives of over half the population in some villages. Smallpox vaccination through a system of Russian hospitals slowed the devastation, but many natives refused it out of distrust and fell victim to the disease. And for others, it was already too late. Facing depopulation, the Russian colonial authorities relocated surviving natives to larger villages and concentrated manpower. In response, at least one tribe, the Klinket, fought back. The Klinket elected a warlord to lead a united Klinket resistance against the Russian settlement, which is today called Sitka. The Klinket captured the town, fortified their positions, and defeated a Russian counterattack at the 1804 Battle of Sitka. The conflict ended with an 1822 settlement that allowed the Klinkets to rebuild their settlements next to Russian Sitka, but relations between the two sides remained tense until Russia left Alaska in 1867. The Tsarist government under Catherine II was appalled at the rough treatment to the natives and ordered the Russian traders to treat the natives as their new brethren. Instead, the Russian-American company requested eight monks to evangelize the natives into subservience in 1794. But the monks had other ideas. They had come to win souls, not to serve RAC policy. Before setting out, the monks were told to behave themselves as guests in a foreign land. In practice, they were to respect Alaskan natives and their cultures while evangelizing. The result was a harmonization of native languages and cultures, particularly Aleut, with orthodoxy. The monks also defended the natives against company abuses, slavery, and indentured servitude, and the Aleut repaid them with their trust and souls. Apart from the faith, the Orthodox Church's most important contribution to the Aleuts and other natives was an alphabet to write their languages so they could learn prayers, catechesis, and create their own works. Saint Innocent of Alaska, one of Russia and Alaska's most prolific writers, learned Aleuts and subsequently wrote the Indication of the Pathway to Heaven. In addition to making converts, he put his energy into further educating the people already in the faith. He translated the Gospel of Matthew, among several other readings, sermons, and prayers. The mission capped its achievements with an Aleut translation of the Orthodox Divine Liturgy, evidence of the Russian Orthodox Church's commitment to its new flock. Alaska has produced many Orthodox saints, most famously its patron Saint Herman, wonder worker of all America. According to the Saint Herman of Alaska Orthodox Church, Herman was among the eight missionaries sent to Kodiak to evangelize the locals, embracing conversion over coercion despite colonial authorities' misgivings. But it worked, netting nearly 7,000 Aleut conversions within the first year of his mission. Herman became a respected figure among the Aleuts, who flocked to him to hear his sermons. But his principal focus was on Aleut children. For them, he founded a bilingual school and an orphanage, and even baked cookies for them out of kindness and affection for his pupils. Inspired by his faith, the Aleuts became ardent defenders of orthodoxy. St. Herman had a young Aleut disciple named Peter, who in 1812 traveled with a Russian expedition to California. There, Spanish authorities captured and tortured them to renounce orthodoxy for Catholicism. Peter refused and died a martyr. Upon hearing of his pupil's death, St. Herman crossed himself and invoked Peter to pray for him and all sinners. The martyred youth eventually became St. Peter the Aleut. By the 1850s, the Russian-American company had a manpower shortage. The fur trade was no longer profitable as otter populations were depleted. No one wanted to move to Alaska anymore, and the colony became a financial drain. The geopolitical situation in 1860 did not favor Russia either. Russia had suffered a humiliating defeat against a rival Franco-British coalition in the Crimean War, and Britain even had a plan to partition Russia. Meanwhile, the British were also looking to partition Russia's only major friend and ally, the United States, by recognizing the Confederacy. The British had designs on Alaska, too. So Tsar Alexander II decided to sell it to the United States and leave it in friendly hands. An 1859 offer was postponed as the Buchanan and Lincoln administrations grappled with secession and the Civil War. But after the war, Russo-American relations were at a high point following cooperation during the American Civil War, and so negotiations went forward. Russia initially asked for $5 million. However, upon seeing Andrew Johnson's Secretary of State William Seward's enthusiasm for purchasing Alaska, the parties agreed upon $7.2 million, a bargain price of two cents per acre. Russia pulled out of the last frontier, leaving its subjects to navigate their new American sovereigns alone. The sale of Alaska was not received enthusiastically among the partly Russified Alaskan natives and the Alaskan Creole class. While the latter group, per the Treaty of Purchase, were given U.S. citizenship, the former were not falling into the category of uncivilized tribes. Once gold was discovered in Alaska in 1896, American prospectors rushed to the territory, leaving former Russian subjects outnumbered in their own lands. For the natives, the Alaskan purchase brought nothing but problems. 
Russia's old Tlingit enemies in particular clashed with American settlers and missionaries attempting to convert them to Protestantism. The Tlingit, despite their problems with Russia, had never faced attempts to eradicate their culture. American missionaries, on the other hand, banned the Tlingit language and culture in their schools to, quote, kill the Indian, save the man. In comparison, the Russian Orthodox Church preserved Alaskan culture and language. In response, the Klinkit rallied around the Russian Orthodox Church, which they turned into their own institution. The Klinkit combined native traditions, Russian spirituality, and the Klinkit language into their Orthodox niche. Even with the material benefits of assimilation, the Klinkit chose Orthodoxy for its compatibility with their native spirituality and worship styles. The result was a collection of Klinkit hymns, prayers, and Russo-Klinkit religious brotherhoods to reinforce Klinkit Orthodoxy. Although Alaska's surviving Russian influence is mostly spiritual, one modern Russian stronghold post-dating the colonial era survives. A group called Old Believers separated from the Orthodox Church in 1666, after the then Patriarch made a series of corrections to the liturgy and changed some other traditions, including how the sign of the cross was made. Objectors were told to fall in line or be persecuted, and the Old Believers chose the latter. They fled to Siberia and other fringe areas of the Russian Empire, where they lived until communist persecution forced them to flee again. With the arrival of communism, at first it was fine, but then they just started coming to the huts and taking everything. The group eventually established the village of Nikolaisk in 1968 after a sojourn in Brazil. The village, located on the Kenai Peninsula, is almost like a time capsule, comparable to Amish or Mennonite towns. Women wear head coverings and long skirts, men don beards, and Russian has traditionally been the chosen language. In some stricter old believer villages outside Nikolaisk, outsiders are not permitted to enter for fear that they will corrupt the lifestyle. Despite attempts to shut out the world, Nikolaisk's current head priest has noted the community has increasingly shifted to English. Many of the town's youth operate principally in English rather than Russian, and many children don't speak it at all. Thus, it seems that Nikolaisk's old believers have become more open to the world, even if reluctantly.